You've got 10 seconds. The countdown going on right now. I'm sorry, I'm not doing it the wrong way. This is Play by Play Cast, the world's number one sports media podcast. Wait, what? Nobody's fact checking it. Just keep going. Here we go. Who the hell is Happy Gilmore? Got all that on camera, right, John? Sure, I did. All right, because the red light was not on. The podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters, hosted by a play by play broadcaster. Oh, you can stick me in some kind of Italian boat because that one is Gondola. Now, from New York. Really? All the big ones are from New York. Your host, Joe Godet. It's still Joel. Yeah, he will not be able to see very well, Cotton. It's episode 188 of PXP Cast. Thanks as always for the subscribe, the stream, the download, however you have found this here podcast. The podcast about play-by-play broadcasters for play-by-play broadcasters hosted by a play-by-play broadcaster. A professional development podcast that dives into the tips, tricks, experience, stories, process, and preparations of some of the biggest and best play-by-play announcers in the business. Episode 188 is with Charlie Steiner of the Los Angeles Dodgers. He has been with the Dodgers since 2005, but before that, spent three seasons in the booth with the New York Yankees. And before that, where he is probably most well-known for folks of my age in our mid-30s, he was a sports center anchor. He also worked for ESPN Radio, broadcasting Major League Baseball. But sports center anchor is what Charlie Steiner was most known for when I was growing up, and probably most known for tying a tie around his head, holding a lantern in the air, and saying, follow me, follow me to freedom. This is SportsCenter commercials. And cracking himself up, Kerry Wood making a relief appearance, Francis Scott off-key, those types of moments on SportsCenter. Uh, But before that, what's uh, what's remarkable about Charlie is that he wasn't a TV guy. Charlie worked in radio at the beginning of his career, and one of the interesting things we'll get into is the development of Charlie Steiner as a broadcaster from radio to television to more of a full-time play-by-play guy. Uh, He also did spend some time broadcasting in the NFL on the radio for the uh, New York Jets in the late 80s, and before that was the voice of the USFL's New Jersey Generals. Yes, the team owned by the president. Um, We will talk very briefly about his time with the USFL as well. A lot of interesting stories to get into with Charlie because he's seen a lot of things, and he's experienced this business from a ton of different angles, unlike a lot of people we've had on this podcast before. The, the Just the way that he has seen broadcasting from the amount of different perspectives makes his perspective unique right off the bat. Charlie was a load of fun to talk to. I enjoyed doing this interview. I hope you kick back and enjoy the next hour on episode 188 with the Los Angeles Dodgers, Charlie Steiner. Was play-by-play something that was on the forefront of your mind as saying that's where I ultimately want to end up when you were 22, 23-year-old Charlie Steiner? I went through a period of transitions on where and how I would get to where I currently am. Uh, When I was seven years old, maybe six, the Dodgers were still playing in Brooklyn. And uh, my mom had a very large radio in her very small kitchen. And I started to hear this baseball game. You know, at that point, we were just kind of playing on the streets. A tree to the right was first base, a tree to the left was third base, and we would pile up some newspapers in the middle of the street with dirt on it, and that was second base. And that's really all I knew about baseball. But there was this voice, and there was the sound of a crowd and the crack of a bat. And again, this is a this is the mid to late 50s. You know, television... Uh, was only black and white. There were half a dozen games on uh, on TV, so it was mostly radio. Um, and I heard this voice, and uh, and I was I was mesmerized. Um, and so I knew then, boy, wouldn't that be neat if? Um, and then as I grew up. And through elementary school, junior high school, high school, um, I would be downstairs in the basement of my parents' home and I would turn the 
TV sound down when there was a game on TV, and I would announce. No, I, actually, I would scream my fool head <laughs> off. It would drive my parents crazy, but okay. And then by high school, I would have, they gave me the role of the, the daily announcements out of the principal's office. So then I get to college again. Maybe someday I could be the play by play announcer for the dog. Um, and then reality set in. And then I thought, well, wouldn't it be neat if I can just get a job as a broadcaster? And that's what I will be when I grow up. Um, uh, one thing, as they say, led to another. Uh, so as soon as I got to school, Bradley University, um, it was a great basketball school at the time. And that was primary reason I went. I was hoping maybe I can call a few games along the way. Um, and then I did. And then, as it turned out, uh, my career is a lot different than uh, my baseball announcing brothers. Uh, so I didn't work the minor leagues or any of that. I, I began <clears throat> in 67 um, and worked in Peoria, Illinois, where I did the news you know, there weren't sports talk stations there. There weren't even sports announcers, maybe the occasional play-by-play -play guy. And then to Davenport, Iowa, where, by and large, I was a news guy covering City Hall and, and, and you know, town meetings and such. Um, there I got a, a three-minute sports cast in the afternoon. That was the first time I dabbled in sports. But I knew that's where I wanted to go if, but again... In those days, you didn't have options. You know, there were no sports networks. There were no sports talk. There was news and music and, 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 and an occasional sports cast. And so there from Davenport, I was only there for six months and it was purgatory. They didn't... <laughs> They did. They weren't at home with me, and I wasn't at home with them. And so, but I was able to get a job in New Haven, and uh, primarily as a news guy. And then, within a few weeks, uh, I was twenty-three at the time. New management had come in and hired me, and they made me the news director of the station. Of uh, and in those days, we had about a dozen people on the staff. I was the newest guy and the youngest guy, but. All right, let's see if this thing can fly. Um, a year and a half later, Hartford called. Would I come up and, and work there? And within a year or so, they turned the format into all news. So now I'm a news guy. Um, three and a half years later, Cleveland calls. Would I come out and uh, run the news station? And at that time, um, they had... Uh, gotten rid of their longtime sportscaster. And, uh, so the first hiring I made to be, to be the sportscaster on the news station, I hired me. Um, and so I, I was doing the sports on the air. I was the news director all there. And that was the first time where things were beginning to happen, where people were noticing what I was doing. From Cleveland uh, to New York, and in New York, I worked at uh, WOR, which was the number one station in uh, the city and in the country. I did the morning sports. Um, and RKO, a short-lived radio network, hired me to be the sports director of uh, that enterprise. Um, and then, so while, <laughs> a little aside on this, you know, laborious answer. I'm hopeful we have a lot of time. Um, <laughs> at, at, at WOR, they, uh, they bought the rights to this uh, local football team in this new league, the USFL, mm -hmm. the New Jersey Generals, where, uh, so I did every one of their games. And then in the uh, second year, uh, a fellow named Trump uh, bought the team. Never, um, never heard of him. Well, you're quite lucky. <laughs> um, 
and, and so from there, then the U- he took the USFL out of business, as he's done many other enterprises. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> then I'm hired at a competing station, WABC, to do the Jets play-by-play, and uh, new management came in, um, and, and several, uh, almost everybody was purged and gone. Uh, but in that period of time, uh, I'm discovered by, you know, by happenstance, um, ESPN was trying to restart Sports Center, which really wasn't, was just a sports show on a sports TV station. I get there at a time, and never having done television before, they put me on the air, but I get there at a time with all these wonderful new people. I came in, and Keith and Dan and Bob Lee, Robin Roberts, Tarico. I mean, so there was this surge of talent and rode a wonderful wave. And while I was at ESPN, uh, I was doing stuff for ESPN radio, and then they uh, secured the MLB Sunday night rights for the radio side. Miller and Morgan uh, would do uh, uh, TV and I was doing it first on radio with Dave Campbell and uh, later Kevin Kennedy. Um, so that was that was the, ba- the so the first baseball games I did was on ESPN, wow. and it went pretty well. Um, and after that, post nine eleven, I was involved intimately with post nine eleven coverage of baseball. It was the most meaningful couple of weeks of uh, my career. Um, Then the uh, Yankees would call and say, uh, would you, uh, would you like to come? My father was in ill health at the time and I was able to go home to New York. I had received a similar offer from the giants in San Francisco, but due to my dad's health, I went home to New York three years. The contract was up and out of the blue, the team that I always wanted to do when I was seven years old, the Dodgers called. And uh, would you like to come out to L.A.? And, uh, I, well, it didn't take long to say yes. <laughs> and I've been out here now going on 16 years. That is the, uh, sadly, the Reader's Digest story. Was the USFL then the first time you had ever called games professionally? Uh, no, actually in... 1980, about the time uh, ESPN was starting, CNN was starting, MTV was starting, the USA Network was starting. So, again, I I, I go back to the dinosaur era. And they had some hockey product. So I was suddenly doing hockey uh, out of the blue, mostly Washington Capitals games. And then they also had um, Japanese baseball uh, that I did in in a studio, basically um, not unlike what I did as a kid, only these were color monitors instead of old black and white TV sets. So... It was a slow process. You know, again, I always had this idea, this hope that, A, I could do Dodger games. What are the chances? B, if short of that, at least baseball, because I've always loved baseball. Um, And so, again, I've had the most serendipitous journey that uh, that, – far beyond anything I could have plotted out. All I wanted to do realistically in college, I wanted to make broadcasting a living. How and what it was going to be and how it would play itself out, that was the journey. I'm going to make some journalism teachers probably happy or journalism professors happy with this one. Um, through all of that, the, the the diversity in what you did, I have to imagine, makes you better each stop along the way. Um, and I've heard another interview you did where one of the things you said about ESPN was that they liked my writing. Mm-hmm. The fact that you were such a good writer, um, 
honed, I'm sure, at various stops along the way. Uh, how did that make you better along the way? And then particularly when you get into a play-by-play setting where you're not writing anything down, but you're writing extemporaneously. Um, That's do, exactly right. Do those things That's go hand in hand? Yes, um, absolutely. You know, ours is a storytelling medium. And so when I was 18 years old, you know, I'm learning how I was always a pretty good writer in high school, you know, term papers and stuff like that. But I wasn't Hemingway. (laughs) Um, And so and again, my career path, as we were talking earlier, is different than most of the guys in our business in that it began on radio in studio or in a city hall, city council meeting or whatever it was. So I had to write. And and writing is, is an intellectual challenge every day. Everybody sees the same thing, but how do they write it? And based on what life's experience, do those words come out? And so writing every day and, and being, you know, doing all news and all of that stuff, it was it, it was storytelling. It was storytelling on, on in those days, typewriter and paper, as opposed to storytelling now with uh, players trotting around on the field doing whatever it is they're doing. So it, it's storytelling. One is with the written word, the other is with the spoken word. But, and so when I was asked to come up to ESPN to audition, again, this is 1988. Um, I had virtually no television experience. For about a year in Cleveland, uh, their local station, the o and NBC O and O, was struggling. Their sports guy was uh, not terrific, so they asked me to come in and do like three taped commentaries a week about. It. And I was one of those, the young firebrand guy, <laughs> and it went pretty well. Uh, but that was my television experience. So then, when they call me out of the blue to come up and audition, and I'd known uh, a fellow named John Walsh, who was the genius mm. behind. Um, ESPN um, and when he called and we'd known each other in passing in New York I said I don't know anything about television he said well you don't have to well okay fine I was again right I had just left ABC in New York and I was still getting paid a pile of money so I I fancied myself as a professional tennis player getting playing twice a day and getting paid twice a month so I go over do the audition and it's awful. I mean, and this is not false humility. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. But I could write a little bit. And John came out of the written word, um, Washington Post, Newsday, uh, several sports magazines, Rolling Stone. And so we, and so they hired me. And I really, I had to learn television on the air. Um, and in 1988, you could get, you could get away with it. Um, and, it, and shortly after I got there, that's when, uh, Keith got there and Dan got there. Robin would come along soon after, uh, young Mike Tarico would be there. So it was all of these people. I just happened to be on, 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 on this, uh, arrival in Bristol, Connecticut, of this unbelievable group of talent, and uh, ESPN and Sports Center took off. Not because of me; I just happened to be fortunate with uh, all those people, and who had considerably more television experience than I did. But I could always tell a story. Um, you could probably speak to this personally, but I mean, you mentioned guys like Dan and Keith and and everybody else of that ilk that was around you at that point in time as well. Um, So maybe from observed experience also, um, in the ESPN book, Hank Perlman said uh, of you, he was our go-to guy in terms of comedy. He knew it and he was good at it. And I, (laughs) I, I, I think in broadcasting, sometimes we all, we all like to think we're funny. uh, And like half of us are right sometimes. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're right half the time, you're you're in the Hall of Fame. How do you like? What a what's it like for you to 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 be funny? And then actually be funny on the air and have it conveyed the right way so that it's not just you making it a good time for yourself or making a good time of the event, but making the listener or viewer at home have a good time while st- uh, still taking in a serious event. I'm not going to blow smoke up your ass. That's one of the best <laughs> questions I've ever, ever had asked of me. Thanks. Um, I never I never considered my – well, I guess I thought myself funny because I always got – C's and D's in conduct. <laughs> when I was in um, elementary school and high school, and I would tell my folks with a straight face, again, I'm 14, 15, 16 years old, trying to make another excuse for a shitty report card, <laughs> um, that I am working on my career. I'm working on ad libs because I was the kid in the back of the class who said funny shit. Um, and they didn't buy the argument, although I was largely serious about saying that. Fast forward, you know, 40 years, 30 years, whatever it was, I'm home visiting my parents. This is, you know, in the mid, late 80s, early 90s. I guess I had started at ESPN and they realized their kid was on TV. Wow. And, and, and my mom asked me this Sunday Evening, you know, dinner in the dining room. When you got all those bad conduct grades <laughs> and you kept telling us you were working on your career, um, you were telling the truth, weren't you? I said, yes. I didn't know how it would help, but I realized I could think pretty quickly on my feet. And sometimes funny stuff came out of my mouth. But I, but I, I wasn't a, a comedian by design. I mean, I did not have, for instance, Craig Kilborn, who was enormously talented. He, I think, wants to be funny. I just happened to, this is how I happened to see the world. And, you know, so uh, the guys who produced the Sports Center commercials, and they, you know, they also have to go down in advertising slash broadcasting history for putting that campaign together and seeing whatever it was that I had and putting me into the spots that they did, I can only be forever indebted to them. Um, I, I, at the end of the day, whatever has made me and my career is simply this is who I am. And I sure hope you like me. I can't change. So if you do, we're going to have a great time together. And if not, you'll go listen to somebody else. And really, it's as simple as that. Um, At least my approach. This is what I got, and I hope you like it. Did you ever have somebody say, like, Charlie, maybe dial it back here a little bit. Um, And how did that make you think on the air because like, like, listen, at some extent I am who I am and, and it, it works for me. I like this or, or where maybe they write in a certain spot and you, you said to yourself, okay, in this spot, I can refine myself to get to the product that, that you became. There was only one brief conversation about that. And again, that's something I hadn't thought about in a million years. When I worked at WOR, which was the number one morning show in New York, consequently the number one show, uh, <laughs> In the country, in terms of what, and it was old line, and uh, you know, our parents listened to it all that, and that was the station that, uh, in the winter time, everybody listened to for school closings. It was a big deal, and I don't remember specifically what the story was, but I had said this team, this player, whatever it was, is is down in the toilet. Didn't mean much to me. After the uh, program is over, I get a call from the news director, a fellow named Lou Adler, who is great. Not good, great. And he kind of read me the riot action. We don't use the toilet on the air. (laughs) And I said, well, we do when we're not on the air. (laughs) Uh, And so that was the only time anybody ever 
questioned anything that I had said on the air. And it, it, it kind of threw me because I didn't think it was that big a deal. But on the other hand, it was also a reminder. When you say something, whatever it is, different people will hear it differently. And you can't control that. You can only control what you can control. So if, if I'm funny, terrific, whatever it was, Hank and the uh, Wyden and Kennedy folks liked what they saw and gave me an inordinate number of uh, punchlines over the years. Um, would you think about that when you wrote stuff? Like when you wrote the Kerry Wood line or like did you, did you script the Francis Scott off key or did that happen naturally? That happened. Um, that again, I'm a hundred years from now when ESPN has whatever anniversary it is <laughs> and I am phosphorus in the ground and so is Carl Lewis. I can guarantee you we will both be at that party. Um, it was one of those moments. Um, and I had seen, uh, the, uh, Carl Lewis, thing all day because I heard it on the, on the radio coming in. We had a staff meeting every morning around 10. I said, I heard the damnedest thing on, uh, on the radio this morning. Carl Lewis doing a really bad national anthem. Do you think we might have it on video? That was in the days when there were video tape rooms and large bulky cassettes and all that. So yes, not only do they have a little bit of it, they have the whole thing. Well, of course, here it is, she's uh, almost 30 years later now. Um, we're watching it, and, and, and they would give me what they called the kickers, the, the, the final right. stories of the night, which were <clears throat> sometimes a little off kilter. <laughs> and, and, and so, I, I, and where I sat again, this is a long time ago at ESPN, we didn't have offices, we had kind of areas, sealed off areas. And mine was right next to the tape machine. So people heard about this thing and they they came in. I probably heard it 25 or 30 times all that whole day leading up to the show. And each time I just laughed because it was so beyond preposterous. <laughs> so I figured I would be laughed out by the time we put it on the air. And I said something to the effect, ladies and gentlemen, our national act. And then they see it. And then I, I'm in the studio before we come back on air while it's being seen on television. Um, everybody in the studio is cracking up. I'm cracking up the cameraman, the uh, prompter guy, the stage manager. Now they come back. And of course, as they say, the rest is history. Um, I'm on the air and I have completely lost it. And I'm thinking, oh, not only have I lost it, I've probably lost my job. Um, and then it came out. It was not pre-planned uh, Francis Scott off key. I don't know where it came from, um, but it, 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 it stuck. And at, at, at the end of the show, again, I'm only on, at ESPN maybe three, four years. So I'm still new trying to figure the television thing out. I go back up to the office, take my earpiece out and figure, okay, this is the end of it. My job, I'm done. And I walk into the newsroom and everybody's on the floor hysterically. <laughs> And I thought, well, ooh, well, maybe I can survive this after all. <laughs> and then that night, Keith and Dan did something I don't believe they ever did before or since. They replayed the entire segment on the 11 o'clock show. And so from that point on, um, Carl and I were uh, joined at the hip. Uh, but it, it, uh, it, the moral of the story is I, I so lost it. I forgot I was on television. And that was a good thing. It, it was liberating. It's like, okay, if I can survive that, I'm okay. And that was the first time I, I would lose it on the air. And then over the years, I guess I became known to some degree that I, I was easy to crack up. And I was okay with that. But there's a good lesson in there, too, because I think – Especially when, you know, I, I can speak to this as a younger person, when you first start doing stuff on television, your thought is always, 
I'm on television. How do I sound? How do I look? This has to be perfect. And what you just said from the fact that you forgot you were on television, and that can be a good thing because it actually lets all what we've just talked about, your, your personality shine through, and that's the authentic thing that people connect with. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I mean, you can only control what you can control. Um, you know, just because you're on television doesn't make you better lo looking or more photogenic. This is who you are. And all you can do in a business such as ours that is uh, subjective rather than objective, do they like you or not? Do they find you funny or not? Do they find you serious or not? Whatever it is, all you can do is present yourself and the story that you are covering. Um, after that, it's out of your control. So that was, uh, again, it was a very valuable lesson for me, Carl Lewis, above and beyond uh, uh, the humor quotient. Um, it, it, was, it really was liberating. It was like, okay, I, I, I'm okay, I survived. You know, there's no blood on the floor. And little did I know that it would be something that, uh, you know, will, will have a shelf life far longer than mine. I know when you first started at ESPN and you were doing like the 2.30 a.m. Sports Center, yeah. uh, you've, you've talked about that you went back in and religiously would self-critique your tapes. Yeah. Um, how long in your career did that last? Like how, how much did you continue to do it at that level? Um, is that something like, do you, will you still go pop in, uh, a Dodgers game and listen back to yourself no, or, or no, no. I, I, you know, I, that, that stuff is grandfathered in now. I, I'm now of the opinion having done it for so long. Once I say it, it's on its way to Pluto and I can't get it back. Uh, so no, I don't, I don't dwell on that, but in the beginning, because I had no experience, um, and wasn't very good. The only thing I could do was go home with this, this bulky, um, video cassette, pop it in at, you know, four o'clock in the morning, whatever it was. And I'd watch it two or three times, much like a, a quarterback will watch game film. What was I doing? How did I look? What did I, you know, am I too loose? Whatever. I just, so it was largely uh, self-taught, although there were a couple of people there at, at ESPN who kind of guided me along the way too. Um, but again, at, at that point, you know, I was not an overnight success. When I started at ESPN, I was 39. I'd already been in the business almost 20 years. Um, so I knew the business. There were just things I didn't know quite how to do. Um, and so I did that religiously. Um, maybe four, five, six months, pretty near every night. And then, I, again, I was very lucky. I had, uh, when I got there, they right. I, I started. I got there on September the first of '88, and by November, I suppose, I was on the air doing that two thirty in the morning Eastern Time show. Um, and then right around Christmas, I'm I'm taken out to lunch by uh, uh, John Walsh and Steve Anderson, the two guys who you know really made Sports Center what it would become. And he said, how's it working out? And I said, well, I'm not real happy. And they said, why? I said, because when I was a kid, I vowed I'd never work 9 to 5. And certainly not 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. <laughs> this ain't fun. And they said, well, don't worry. Um, come February 1st, they said, um, we're, we're going to put you on the 7 o'clock show, which was a writer show, less highlights and more where I could do what I do reasonably well. Yeah. And, uh, and they kept their promise, and I did the 7 o'clock show for the next 12, 13 years. First with a fellow named Bill Patrick, and then uh, with Bob, Bob Lee, and then a few years later, Robin Roberts, and the three of us would work together 
for seven of those years. So I was, again, I'm, I am a, a lucky son of a bitch. You've said uh, in some other interviews I've heard as well, um, and even before that, I, so Kevin Harlan's been on this podcast before, and one of the things that mm-hmm. he said that most resonated with me was that at the end of calling a game, he is exhausted. Yep. And you should be exhausted because while this is fun, it's still a job and it is still hard work. And uh, one of the things that, that I've seen you say in the past is that this is a really hard job. Mm-hmm. Um when it comes, I guess, specifically to calling games, but if you want to take it in, in a different direction, sure. Um, what's really hard about this? And what, um, what's what been the most difficult part uh, throughout your career to grasp a hold of? Here's why it's hard. You have no safety net. You're, you're tap dancing on a tight wire for however long the broadcast is. And you, you have to remain completely focused. I suppose to some degree, maybe it's a mixed metaphor, but it's like a, 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 an auto race driver. You have no room to, uh, to miss a turn. And certainly it's not life and death, but in our business, it's like, oh man, you, you just don't want to mess up like that. And, and and the guys who are really good at what we do make that difficulty seem not even an issue. But inside, as you're working a game and you're working that moment um, and you are focused in, you know when you have nailed it and you know better than all when you haven't. Um, and so it's, it's the focus whether it's two, three, four, five, six, eight hours, whatever it is, you're there. You're inside the capsule. And so that, I think, is what makes it hard. Then throw into the mix, it's every single day. Look, that's there is not an ounce of, gee, feel sorry for us <laughs> doing what we do, but that is the reality that we don't have the luxury, the leisure, or the latitude of straying off course, or we cannot be as good as we'd like to be. How'd you That's get, what makes it hard. How'd you get settled into calling baseball in particular? Because, I mean, like you said at the beginning, the, the first time you're really calling baseball games is on ESPN. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't. Re- I don't recommend that career path. <laughs> like, what questions were you asking at that time, and and how did you get yourself comfortable to to be on that that stage doing something that was newer compared to what you had been doing? Well, again, I think again, I look at games, doing games differently than most of my brethren because of the background that I had hmm. covering stories as opposed to riding the buses. Uh, So my focus always was in whatever game uh, that I'm doing, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, hockey, boxing, uh, I'm telling a story. The story happens to be, um, you know, nine guys out on the field, one guy in the batter's box, a couple of guys on, and so, Painting the picture of the story um, is how I process it. Uh, Again, I think other announcers might have a a, a different approach to it. But for me, we're telling a story and, you know, breaking ball down and away two and one is a little itty bitty part of the story. But big picture, you know, runners at first and third, two out bottom of the ninth. You're painting the picture. Um, So we look at the same thing, we and my brethren and sisterin, um, but we come from it with different life's experiences. Um, I guess that's the best way to answer it. But, But and again, the more you do, the better you get. And if the more you do and you don't get better, then you're in the wrong profession. 
Um, let me ask you about a couple stories on that note sure. then. Um, there's a couple things. You mentioned one that I want to go back to, but uh, I've read Jeff Perlman's book about the USFL. Um, and in it, uh, there's, there's actually a, a, a full page quote of yours that leads into a chapter. Um, Herschel Walker's signing, obviously a big deal. You called it a nuclear bomb going off. Um, what's it like to tell a story like that in a setting like that, where it's a brand new team and, and a brand new venture? It, it was one of those moments I'll always remember now that you bring it up. You know, Herschel Walker was the first player to come out of college to sign a professional contract prior to four years at school. The USFL is a new deal. Now, remember, Trump did not sign Herschel Walker. Right. The previous owner, J. Walter Duncan, did. And again, I'm a young guy. This is my f the first football team I am announcing for. And the Generals would become, I guess, the Dallas Cowboys of the USFL. They were bigger than they were, and they weren't as good as they thought they were. <laughs> but okay. So now, before preseason practice begins, remember, the season began... February, March, something like that. On this day in Orlando, Florida, arriving in a helicopter, uh, Herschel Walker, the owner of the team, Chuck Fairbanks was the head coach. And, and you know, when, when a helicopter lands, everything's blowing and hats are flying. And now he gets off and it's like, whoa, this is a big deal. The USFL wasn't, at least at that point, thinking, oh, we're going to be secondary here. We're, we're going full bore. they got the best college football player on the planet and maybe one of the top ten college players of all time, and here he comes. And it's like, okay, this is, uh, uh, in, metaphorically speaking, a, a big bomb that has been set off. The NFL couldn't help but notice. Now, college kids will be able to come out of school early. All of that stuff. And here's Walker on this new team that, hey, I'm going to broadcast. <laughs> whoop de doo um, and, and so it, that, again, the visual of that uh, it will always stick with me that, uh, you know, again, the helicopter blades are whirring and stuff is flying around. And here comes um, Walker with the owner and the coach and, it was a, that, for me as a young a young broadcaster. That was a pretty cool moment. You've said that you didn't, you know, your your path was different. That you didn't, you know, ride the the buses and you know through all the minor league stops and towns. But um, I, I know you've also said that there were things that you know that was the absurdity of the USFL. So well, it's not it's not minor league baseball experiences, but I, I know that the USFL had some uh, quirks to it. Um, what was the most absurd of experiences that you maybe had in those what, three years? The USFL, and I think if you talk to anybody who was involved in that league, players, coaches, media people, was as much pure fun and joy as any three-year period I had in my career. It was this young league that was going head to head with uh, the NFL. They had you know, some money. Then they, they were going to start slowly as a as a spring league, and they were making stuff up along the way. You know, the USFL two point conversion first one. The USFL had. Um, TV replays. Did you I mean, literally? So, did you literally sit with Chet Simmons in his office and talk about the two point yeah, conversion? Yeah, you know. I, I, again, I was in New York. Again, just dumb luck. I was work, working in New York. Chet was the uh, commissioner. A fellow named Peter Hadhazy was the uh, director of operations who I had first met when I worked in Cleveland, where he was the general manager of the Browns. And there was a fellow Dom Camera who was in charge of marketing, and they were just good guys. And, you know, I would come over. It was a 
five or six block walk from my office to uh, their to their offices, and we just sit around and talk and throw ideas out. First, another little thing in one of those they weren't meetings; we were just hanging out and having a diet coke. Um, they asked me, they said, and in those days, wide receivers had to wear. 80 something, 81, 82, 83, um, because that's what they did in, in the NFL. And, and so they asked me, again, from a play by play guy's point of view, what if they could wear whatever number? I said, then we, as play by play guys, would be able to better remember who the guy was. If he's wearing number seven, boom, you know, it's Eric Trevelyan um, or whoever it may be. Who, and, and, so there, and so that was another thing. So we just, they threw out ideas. Some worked, some didn't. Um, and so it was, it was juvenile anarchy. Um, we just, they just did stuff. And if it worked, great. And if it didn't, set it aside and move on. And, and in many ways, that's exactly what we did in the early years of Sports Center. We just did stuff. And if it worked, great. And if it didn't, we wouldn't do it again. There wasn't that pressure that there was or is now, certainly. We just went out and did stuff and 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 it kind of worked out very much like the USFL. I'm trying to envision like Rob Manfred just having Sweeney Murdy over to his office to talk about rules. Um. You know, again, <laughs> it was, that's what made the USFL so utterly unique and so much fun. And when I tell you, um, people who were involved in that league um, – remember it uh, very fondly. And, and when you run across somebody who is involved in the league as a player, as a broadcaster, as coach, there is, there's that bond because we were close to making it happen until uh, Trump and Roy Cohn took it off the rails and killed the league. What's the dichotomy of having been in that league and then the next year you're doing the Jets? Yes. So going from that situation to obviously what's a much different feel as both a league and I have to imagine as a, as a play-by-play -play person and a media member. It's still the game. You know, so all the other stuff, that that's just trappings. You know, you're still calling a football game. And, you know, you just... I, so I don't know that it is significantly different. You know, we had, it was more off-field craziness in the USFL because you had a lot of guys who were just hoping to make it. Some guys who were certainly on the downward slide and had no chance of making it. And then the guys in the middle who were trying to figure out can they make it or not. So those stories I always found to be more compelling. But once they're on the field and they're playing a game, you know, a right tackle bowling over a, a, a linebacker to create some space for a running back. doesn't matter what uniform they're wearing. Um, so, again, it, it was the off-field atmospherics um, more than anything else. But the game's the game, and, and we discovered great players in the USFL um, that we, we had never heard of and uh, who – went on to uh, have Hall of Fame NFL careers. So, again, it was, it was a wonderful experience on this, uh, on this crazy path that, that I've been on. But loved it. Loved USFL. You said one of the most meaningful things you've done was the post-9-11 um, yeah. coverage. Well, I, I mean, I, I can say what about it, but I feel like that that's, fairly stands on its own, but, but what about it? What, what sticks with you to this day? We had just gone through some horrific attack on the country, something that we had never experienced before. The country was down and, and, and we were all seeking to regain our equilibrium. Um, and so on the 10th of September, um, 
No, actually, on the 11th of September, I was on the phone with our travel folks. And again, in the good old days, I was scheduled to do a, uh, a game in Oakland that night. And then after the game, take a red eye to Atlanta to do whatever game we were going to do. In those days, you could run to the airport, get onto the plane, door closes, they take off. No such luck anymore. Mm. So September 11th happens, and the country has just come to a halt. Um, and then the question was, when does this mourning period end? How does it end? And how are we and what are we supposed to feel? They decide that Monday, the 17th of September, would be the uh, first games back. And I uh, was asked to do uh, the Phillies and Braves at, uh, at Veterans Stadium. And I'm driving down from Connecticut, ESPN, to Philly, and there's a an exit on, on the highway that uh, I could get off at New Haven and take the train, or I could continue to drive. I opted to take the train. And as we're coming out of the tunnel on the way to Philadelphia to our left, we see the smoldering ruins of the World Trade Center. This is just, you know, six days later, and it's still, oh, it's, it was one of, again, one of those visions you never forget. Get to Philadelphia. The game is going to be at 7 o'clock. I'm there at like 1. Check in to the hotel. Go to the ballpark. And the players don't know how to feel. I don't know how. None of us know, is this the right time to return? Whatever it was, I was fortunate enough to be on the front line of coming back post 9-11. Um, and I was sitting in the stands behind the first base dugout with Scott Rowland, who's a nice guy. And from that moment on, we really forged uh, one of those friendships of something that we will always share. And we were talking about, is this the appropriate time to come back? Should we wait long? We, no, again, we had no practice in any of this stuff. Um, he didn't, wasn't especially happy to be there. Again, we didn't know how to feel. And I didn't know either, other than I had a story to tell. Well, we go upstairs, and an hour or two before the game, I'm having a pregame bite with uh, the late Harry, Call uh, late Harry Callis and the late uh, Skip Carey. Three of us. Two great broadcasters, and I'm, I'm, I'm the caboose on their train, and we're trying to figure out, what do we do? And it was Harry who said to, to Skip and I, fellas, you just tell them what you see. And it was as simple, uh, I can't say simple as that, but it was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, and like everybody else, very halting and coming off the open of the broadcast. The national anthem was a little more uh, meaningful than before. And so two things happened. One, Chipper Jones is announced for his second at bat at Veteran Stadium, and the fans boo the hell out. And I said on the air, maybe this is our first step back. Um, and Scott Rowland, who didn't especially want to be there that night, hit two home runs and was the hero of the game. And it was like, wow. Uh, a few days later, the, the Mets are hosting uh, the Braves at Shea Stadium. And that was the game where Piazza hit the home run. And there was not a dry eye in the house. It was one of those dramatic, wonderful moments you always remember. Um, and so to be a part of that, to be on the front line of the recovery of a 
devastating attack on the country was was made, made me proud and, and, and satisfied and gratified. And then, as you remember, uh, 2001, the season ended with Barry Bonds and the home run chase. Mm. And so I was involved in all of those. So for that that month or six weeks, whatever it was, um, everything that we did uh, was meaningful. And talking about what we were talking about before, not having uh, a safety net and being on a tightrope, talking about concentration and physical and mental exhaustion was all rolled into one, but we got through it. Um, So we can do good. Our business can actually do good um, if given the opportunity and then following through on doing it. That's, uh, That's really well said. Um, Because I think sometimes we lose sight of that fact because we think we just talk about sports. Yeah. And and again, I'm I'm now of that age where it's, yeah, people ask, are you a homer? Not really. But the, the real answer is if the home team wins, it is in the best interest of the team, of most of the audience you're listening to, and ultimately for you. But if they don't, it's your job and responsibility to tell the folks why they didn't. So that, again, goes back to the news gene in me that uh, began at at the start of my professional career, telling a story. Well, and I think that when it comes to the hometown side of things also, like there was a quote when you left ESPN that Vin Scully had told you the best job is to cover a hometown team. Mm-hmm. Um, what's different in your eyes being the voice of the Dodgers or being one of the voices of the Yankees um, and having the vested interest in who wins as opposed to being the guy who shows up and just wants a good game and, and a good story – um, but the outcome has no bearing on your mindset uh, when you it go home really, at night. It really doesn't. Um, Vin would always say, um, they're going to win with you or win without you. So, again, you have no control over that. All you can control is the broadcast of the game that you are watching. Um the other stuff can't control that. Don't know. Um, and and Vin to the very I talked to him about a week or so ago at the end of his career. Look, I am I, nothing has fundamentally changed. Um, you, you tell the story as accurately as photogenically, especially on the radio. Sounds like a contradiction in terms, but no, <laughs> painting the picture um, as best as you can based on your life's experiences. And and Vin was told that by, by Red Barber and Red came over to him one day and around 1950 or so. And he said, you have something, he said to Vin, that nobody on earth has. And Vin's thinking, well, okay. And Red Barber said, you that's what you've got is you, um, and, and and which goes back to essentially what we were talking about earlier. Um, I can't control what people are watching or hearing. Once it's out of my mouth, it's gone. I asked Mariano Rivera years ago. Um, he had lost. Oh my God or had blown two saves in as many nights. And in New York, the Post and the Daily News, they were killing them, and uh, and the sports talk stations were killing them. And it's 2 o'clock the following afternoon, and Mariano, who's just, he's as good a human being as he was a player. I said, do you bring that stuff home with you at night? Do you bring it back with you when you're driving to the ballpark in the morning? 
And he looked at me like I was from another planet. And he said, once the ball leaves my hand, I have no control over it. Hmm. And it was like, wow. And that, that was such a, for me, such a deep answer because it had more than to do with baseball. Once it's done, it's done. Now, how do you control what happens after it's done? So, again, I, I, I kind of use that mindset in, in going about my business every day. Um, last question I have for you, um, sure. then is, uh, you talked about when you went to New York and you, you, you did your work with the Yankees, um, how one of the things that it afforded you was the fact that your father, um, in ill health could listen to his son mm-hmm. on the radio every night. Um, so I, what that made me think about was, you know, like there's the famous Marty Glickman line of consider the listener. Um, did did you ever have a thought at that point or did that change maybe your outlook of or give you a, a different kind of purpose of being able to speak to one person um, and maybe change a little bit of you know how you thought about the audience or or who directly you're speaking to and maybe how that impacts the type of game that you call um, for the better? Only vaguely. Um... I, again, I call a game, and I look at life, and if people think I'm funny, I'm funny, because that's what happens, happened to occur to me in that moment, and goes from, you know, eyes, brain, mouth. <laughs> um, so, But I do want to know, on the other hand, I want to know who the audience is, so I have some vague idea. Um and, and, and so, but I don't dwell on it. There are others, you know, who will live with focus groups and research and who's <laughs> listening and who's, I can't do that. It's too complicated for me. I just go call a game and, and hopefully, as I say, it, it, it's as accurate and as entertaining and as uh, descriptive as it can possibly be. Um, and I hope they like it. I, and I hope, my dad liked it, um, and I hope whoever is listening likes it. Shit, I've been doing this for, what, 53, 54 years since I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, it, it's pretty much worked. Yeah. Um, Charlie, uh, I guess how do people get more of you in their lives? Can they can they follow you online, or how do they get a hold of the Dodgers? Oh, when, no, when no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I, I am, I am, I am a social media <laughs> hermit. Um, I firmly believe that I don't care about much of what I think. Lord knows why should I share it with anybody else? So no, I, 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 I am of the age where, thankfully, uh, social media is not part of my equation at all. Um, more, more times than not, I see friends and even people I do not know say incredibly stupid things that you can't take back. So it keeps me from saying incredibly stupid things that I don't have to. All right. That is Charlie Steiner joining us here on PXP cast. Thanks as always for tuning in. If you missed last week, episode 187, Corey Provis of the Minnesota Twins. Do go check that one out. We've been on a baseball kick lately. Dwayne Stats a couple episodes ago. Uh, Marv Albert, though, if you have not caught the Marv Albert episode, uh, just scroll through. I believe it was six weeks ago now at this point. You can find uh, the episode with the longtime, let's just call him voice of the NBA here on PXP Cast. Until next week, we're off. My name is Joel Gadet. The music is Marshmallow. This is PXP Cast, and we are out. And that will do it from St. Louis, where the score is inconclusive.